Picking cotton, yeah, a mass of Picking cotton, a mass of uh-huh. The back can't have no slack, get a broken back. Uh-huh. Yeah, a mass of yeah. Need some water, child. Yeah. A mass of Need some water for my son. You get that a bag filled up, get a half a cup for oh, yeah. my son. On a burning, yeah. Make the cotton grow Whoa. Yeah. For my son Weighing cotton, child yeah. For my son Weighing cotton now yeah. For freedom yeah. uh-huh. Captain, I treat you rough Didn't pick enough yeah. For freedom The day's work was over in the field. The baskets are toted, or in other words, carried to the gin house where the cotton is weighed. No matter how fatigued or weary he may be, no matter how much he longs for sleep and rest, a slave never approaches the gin house with his basket of cotton but with fear. If it falls short in weight, if he has not performed the full task appointed him, he knows that he must suffer, and if he has exceeded it by ten or twenty pounds, in all probability his master will measure the next day's task accordingly. It was rarely that a day passed by without one or more whippings. This occurred at the time the cotton was weighed. The slave coffle was a familiar sight in many parts of the South. The sun was shining out very hot that day. In turning an angle of the road, we encountered the following group. First, a little cart drawn by one horse, in which five or six half-naked black children were tumbled like pigs together. The cart had no covering. They seemed to have been broiled to sleep. Behind the cart marched three black women, with head, neck, and breasts uncovered, without shoes or stockings. Next came three men, bareheaded, half-naked, chained together with an ox chain. Last of all came a white man, on horseback, carrying pistols in his belt. The slave coffles were usually seen on the dusty southern roads between the months of October and May, for it was during that time that the plantation work was the lightest, and a slave on a new plantation had time to get adjusted before the hardest work season began. However, the slave coffle itself was sometimes such a torturous experience that many died en route, and the survivors were hardly fit for anything but death by the time they reached the end. My new master, whose name I did not hear, took me that same day across the Patuxet, where I joined 51 other slaves who he had bought in Maryland. 32 of these were men and 19 were women. The women were merely tied together with a rope about the size of a bed cord, which was tied like a halter round the neck of each. But the men, of whom I was the stoutest and strongest, were very differently caparisoned. A strong iron collar was closely fitted by means of a padlock round each of our necks. A chain of iron about a hundred feet in length was passed through the hasp of each padlock except that the two ends where the hasp of the padlocks passed through a link of the chain. In addition to all this, we were handcuffed in pairs with iron staples and bolts, with a short chain about a foot long uniting the handcuffs and their wearers in pairs. In this manner, we were chained alternately by the right and left hand, and the poor man to whom I was thus ironed wept like an infant when the blacksmith with his heavy hammer fastened the ends of the bolts that kept the staples from slipping from our arms. 
For my own part, I felt indifferent to my fate. It appeared to me that the worst had come and that no change of fortune could harm me. I was born in Georgia, in Norcross, and I'm 90 years old. My father's name was Roger Steelson, and my mother's name was Betty. Massa Early Steelson captured them in Africa and brung them to Georgia. He got killed, and my sister and me went to his son. His son was a killer. He got in trouble in Georgia and got him two good stepping horses and the covered wagon. Then he chains all his slaves round the neck and fastens the chains to the horses and makes them walk all the way to Texas. My mother and my sister had to walk. Emma was my sister. Somewhere on the road it went to snowing and Massa wouldn't let us wrap anything round her feet. We had to sleep on the ground too in all that snow. Massa have a great long whip plaited out of rawhide and when one of the slaves fall behind or give out he hit them with that whip. It would take the hide every time he hit a slave. Mother, she give out the, on the way about on the line of Texas. Her feet got raw and bleeding, and her legs swole plumb out of shape. Then Massa, he just take out his gun and shot her, and while she lay dying, he kicks her two, three times and say, Damn a nigger what can't stun nothing. You know that man? He wouldn't bury Mother. Just leave her laying where he shot her at. Sometimes the slaves were kept overnight and longer at a specially built slave jail, while the slave trader went around to the neighboring plantations to buy more slaves. He would then add these to his coffle, and pistol on his hip marched them down the road and sometimes to the railroad for the long journey to the deep south. They would come in on foot, each one carrying an old tow sack on his back with everything he's got in it. Over the hills, they would come in the lines, reaching as far as you could see. They walked in double lines, chained together in twos. The slavers walked them here to the railroad and shipped them in coal cars to the cotton country. Had a slave jail built at the crossroads with iron bars across the windows. Soon as the cough will get there, they bring all the slaves from the jail two at a time and string them along the chain back of the other post slaves. Everybody in the villages come out, especially the wives and sweethearts and mothers, to see their sold-off children for the last time. And when they start the chain of clanking and step off down the line, they all just sing and shout and make all the noises they can, trying to hide the sorrow in their hearts and cover up the cries and moaning of them they were leaving behind. Oh, Lord. Not all slaves marched in coffles. Some were shipped by steamboat. Solomon Northup was one of these. He was one of the many blacks who was born free in the North, kidnapped by slave traders and sold into slavery. For twelve years he worked as a slave in Louisiana before regaining his freedom. We left the steamboat road off at a place called Alexandria, several hundred miles from New Orleans. It is a small town on the southern shore of Red River. Having remained there overnight, we entered the morning train of cars and were soon at Bayou Lamori, a still smaller place, distance eighteen miles from Alexandria. At that time it was the termination of the railroads. Ford's plantation was situated on the Texas Road twelve miles from Lamori in the Great Pine Woods. This distance, it was announced to us, must be traveled on foot. Accordingly, we all set out in the company of Ford. It was an excessively hot day. The whole country about Red River is low and marshy. The Pine Woods, as they are called, is comparatively a plain with frequent small intervals running through them. This upland is covered with numerous trees, the white oak, the chinquapin, resembling chestnut, but principally the yellow pine. They are of great size, running up sixty feet and perfectly straight. The woods were full of cattle, very shy and wild, dashing away in herds with a loud snuff at our approach. Some of them were marked or branded. The rest appeared to be in their wild and untamed state. They are much smaller than northern breeds, and the peculiarity about them that most attracted my attention was their horns. They stand out from the sides of the head precisely straight like two iron spikes. At noon we reached a cleared piece of ground containing three or four acres. After a long rest we set forth again following the Texas road which had the appearance of being very rarely traveled. For five miles we passed through continuous woods without observing a single habitation. At length, just as the sun was sinking in the west, we entered another opening containing some twelve or fifteen acres. In this opening stood a house. 
It was two stories high with a piazza in front. In the rear of it was also a log kitchen, poultry house, corn cribs, and several Negro cabins. Near the house was a peach orchard and gardens of orange and pomegranate trees. The space was entirely surrounded by woods and covered with a carpet of rich, rank verdure. It was a quiet, lonely, and pleasant place, literally a green spot in the wilderness. It was the residence of my master, William Ford. It was also to be the residence of Solomon Northup, slave. This was the plantation, a world within itself, the stage upon which the slaves acted out the parts assigned to them and at the same time lived their lives. Chapter 3. The Plantation The Plantation It was a large white mansion with fluted columns and a broad porch. Massive trees spread their limbs over a circular driveway which led up to the house. From the carriages which rolled up the driveway stepped finely dressed men and women, the aristocracy of southern culture. Once inside the mansion, these ladies and gentlemen sat beneath chandeliers in high-ceiling rooms and discoursed on the topics of the day. And all the while they were attended to by unobtrusive, attentive, and faithful Negro slaves. Somewhere in the background, out of sight, were the slave quarters with their inhabitants. Such is the picture that is often presented of the southern plantation. It is not a true one. There were a few plantations which fit the above description, but these were the exceptions. Most plantation owners lived modestly, and some even poorly. In the slave-holding South, the more slaves a man owned, the more respected he was. In other words, the more human beings he held by force and against their will, the more highly regarded he was. It is generally thought that all slave owners held hundreds of slaves. The reality was quite different. In 1860, there were 384,884 slave owners in the South. Of that number, less than 3,000 owned more than 100 slaves. The overwhelming majority of slaveholders held less than 20 slaves. Yet, even if a man held only one or two slaves, he had considerably more status in Southern society than a man who held no slaves. As a group, the slave owners controlled the South, even though they were a decided minority. Fully three-fourths of the South white population held no slaves, but the economy of the South was built upon slavery, even though that slavery profited only one-fourth of the white population, and the black population not at all. The plantation was a world in itself. It was composed of the slave owner's house, the big house, as the slaves called it. There was Slave Row, the line of little cabins which the slaves called home, for lack of a better term. Situated near Slave Row was the house of the overseer, Scattered about the plantation were various barns and sheds where animals, tools, and the harvested crops were stored. And surrounding everything were fields and woods, beyond which somewhere was freedom. My master's house was a brick. Brick houses are by no means common amongst the planters, whose residences are generally built of framework, whether boarded with pine boards and covered with shingles of the white cedar or juniper cypress and contained two large parlors and a spacious hall of entry on the ground floor. The main building was two stories high, and attached to this was a smaller building, one story and a half high, with a large room where the family generally took breakfast, with a kitchen at the farther extremity from the main building. There was a spacious garden behind the house containing, I believe, about five acres, well cultivated and handsomely laid out. At one end of the main building was a small house called the library in which my master kept his books and papers and where he spent much of his time. At some distance from the mansion was a pigeon house and near the kitchen was a large wooden building called the kitchen quarter in which the house servants slept and where they generally took their meals. Here also the washing of the family was done and all the rough or unpleasant work of the kitchen department such as cleaning and scaling fish putting up pork, etc., was assigned to this place. There was no barn on this plantation, but there was a wooden building about uh, 40 feet long called the coach house, in one end of which the family carriage and the chase in which my master rode were kept. Under the same roof was a stable, sufficiently capacious to contain 10 or 12 horses. In one end of the building, the corn intended for the horse was kept, 
and the whole of the loft or upper story was occupied by the fodder of blades and tops of the corn. The houses of the slaves were generally more fit for animals than human beings. There were a few notable exceptions, however. One of these was the houses Thomas Jefferson built for his slaves at Monticello, which were the envy of all Albemarle County. Their quarters were comfortable brick dwellings with real floors, doors that shut tight, and windows with glass panes. Jefferson's slave row at Monticello was a continuous brick structure built into the side of the hill and partitioned into one-room cabins. More typical were the houses George Washington built for his slaves. Julian Nemchevich, a Polish poet, spent two weeks at Mount Vernon in 1798 and wrote this description of conditions there. We entered some Negroes' huts, for their habitations cannot be called houses. They are far more miserable than the poorest of the cottages of our peasants. The husband and his wife sleep on a miserable bed, the children on the floor. A very poor chimney, a little kitchen furniture, stands amid this misery, a tea kettle and cups. A boy about 15 was lying on the floor with an attack of dreadful convulsions. The general had sent to Alexandria for a physician. A small orchard with vegetables was situated close to the hut. Five or six hens, each with 10 or 15 chickens, walked there. That is the only pleasure allowed to Negroes. They are not permitted to keep either ducks or geese or pigs. They sell the chickens in Alexandria and buy with the money some furniture. They receive a peck of Indian corn every week, and half of it is for the children, besides 20 herrings in a month. They receive a cotton jacket and a pair of breeches yearly. The general possesses 300 Negroes, excepting women and children, of which a part belongs to Mrs. Washington. And from the slave's point of view, the picture was even more grim. The softest couches in the world are not to be found in the log mansion of the slaves. The one whereon I reclined year after year was a plank twelve inches wide and ten feet long. My pillow was a stick of wood. The bedding was a coarse blanket and not a rag or shred besides. Moss might be used were it not that it directly breeds a swarm of fleas. The cabin is constructed of logs without floor or window. We lodged in log huts and on the bare ground. Wooden floors were an unknown luxury. In a single room were huddled like cattle, ten or a dozen persons, men, women, and children. All ideas of refinement and decency were, of course, out of the question. There were neither bedsteads nor furniture of any description. Our beds were collections of straw and old rags, thrown down in the corners and boxed in with boards, a single blanket the only covering. Our favorite way of sleeping, however, was on a plank, our heads raised on an old jacket and our feet toasting before the smoldering fire. The wind whistled and the rain and snow blew in through the cracks and the damp earth soaked in the moisture till the floor was miry as a pigsty. Such were our living quarters. The principal food of those upon my master's plantation consisted of cornmeal and salt herrings, to which was added in summer a little buttermilk and the few vegetables which each might raise for himself and his family on the little piece of ground which was assigned to him for that purpose. It's called a truck patch. In ordinary times, we had two regular meals a day, breakfast at 12 o'clock after laboring from daylight, and supper when the work of the remainder of the day was over. In harvest season, we had three. Our dress was of tow cloth. For the children, nothing but a shirt. For the older ones, a pair of pantaloons, or a gown in addition, according to the sex. Besides these, in the winter, a round jacket or overcoat, a wool hat once in two or three years for the males, and a pair of coarse shoes once a year. The Plantation it was like a country unto itself, and within its confines, large or small, life was generally the same for the slave. His principal occupation was work, and the work with which he was principally occupied was cotton. It was a crop that needed much care and long hours of tedious work. One could tell the month of the year by what work was being done on the cotton. Some crops can be planted, hoed, and left to grow until time for harvest, not cotton. The ground is prepared by throwing up beds or ridges with the plow, back furrowing it is called. Oxen and mules, the latter almost exclusively, are used in plowing. The women as frequently as the men perform this labor, 
feeding, currying, and taking care of their teams, and in all respects, doing the field and stable work. A moment idle, he is whipped. In fact, the lash is flying from morning until night, the whole day long. The hoeing season thus continues from April until July, a field having no sooner been finished once than it is commenced again. In the latter part of August, the cotton-picking season begins. From the time the stars began to fade from the sky in the morning until they reappeared in the evening, the slaves worked at cotton, and at everything else which had to be done on the plantation. Each day ended as the previous one had, each day began as the previous one had, and each day expended itself as the previous one had. Yes, sir. I could hear it now. Old overseer used to blow us out at sunrise on the conquer shell. Toot, toot. Had to get your breakfast before day. "'cause you had to be in the field when the sun gets to showing itself about the trees. "'I think about 168 assembled this morning at the sound of the horn. Two or three being sick sent word to the overseer that they could not come. "'The overseer then led off to the field with his horn in one hand and his whip in the other, "'we following, men, women, and children, promiscuously, and the wretched-looking group we were. "'There was not an entire garment among us.' More than half of the gang was entirely naked, several young girls who had arrived at puberty, wearing only the livery with which nature had ornamented them, and a great number of lads of an equal or superior age appeared in the same custom. There was neither bonnet, cap, nor headdress of any kind amongst us except the old straw hat that I wore. Some of the men had old shirts and some ragged trousers, but no one wore both. Amongst the women, several wore petticoats, and many had shifts. Not one of the whole number wore both of these vestments. We walked nearly a mile through one vast cotton field before we arrived at the place of our intended day's labor. An hour before daylight, the horn is blown. The slaves arouse, prepare their breakfast, fill a gourd with water in another, deposit their dinner of cold bacon and corn cake, and hurry to the field again. It is an offense, invariably followed by a flogging to be found at the quarters after daybreak. Then the fears and labors of another day begin, and until it's closed there is no such thing as rest. With the exception of ten or fifteen minutes, which is given them at noon to swallow their allowance of cold bacon, they are not permitted to be a moment idle until it is too dark to see, and when the moon is full, they often sometimes labor till the middle of the night. They do not dare to stop even at dinner time, nor return to the quarters, however late it be, until the order to halt is given by the driver. When the order to halt was finally given, it was weighing in time. Each slave was expected to pick at least two hundred pounds of cotton a day. That was the minimum for everybody. Generally, the overseer learned how much more than that each slave could pick, and that was his daily task. The day's work was over in the field. The baskets are toted, or in other words, carried to the gin house where the cotton is weighed. No matter how fatigued or weary he may be, no matter how much he longs for sleep and rest, a slave never approaches the gin house with his basket of cotton but with fear. If it falls short in weight, if he has not performed the full task appointed him, he knows that he must suffer, and if he has exceeded it by ten or twenty pounds, in all probability his master will measure the next day's task accordingly. It was rarely that a day passed by without one or more whippings. This occurred at the time the cotton was weighed. The delinquent, whose weight had fallen short, was taken out, stripped, made to lie upon the ground face downwards when he received a punishment proportioned to his offense it is the literal unvarnished truth that the crack of the lash and the shrieking of the slaves can be heard from dark till bedtime on epps plantation any day almost during the entire period of the cotton picking season the number of lashes is graduated according to the nature of the case twenty-five are deemed a mere brush inflicted for instance when a dry leaf or a piece of bowl is found in the cotton or when a branch is broken in the field fifty is ordinary penalty following all delinquencies at the next higher grade one hundred is called severe it is the punishment inflicted for the serious offense of standing idle in the field Every night after work was over, us slaves had to gin cotton. Of course they had the gin machine, but it never worked fast as us niggers would pick the cotton and was always breaking down. See that foot? Wears a size 14 shoe. I does, and near as I can recollect, 
I was the same size in them days. Well, sir, everybody had a gin of shoe full of cotton at night before going to bed. Old overseer would make the old women pack everybody's shoe tight with cotton, and they got to see that shoe full. I had such a big pile that the others used to finish a long time before me. They all used to laugh at me and joke while they was ginning, because I got such a lot to do. I used to wrap my feet up in rags nights so they can keep them from getting any bigger. But it didn't help any. Yet once the slaves left the field, their work was far from finished. Each one must then attend to his respective chores. One feeds the mules, another the swine, another cuts the wood, and so forth. Finally, at a late hour, they reach the quarters, sleepy and overcome with the long day's toil. Then a fire must be kindled in the cabin, the corn ground in the small hand mill, and supper and dinner for the next day in the field prepared. All that is allowed them is corn and bacon, which is given out at the corn crib and smokehouse every Sunday morning. Each one receives, as his weekly allowance, three and a half pounds of bacon and corn enough to make a peck of meal. That is all. No tea, coffee, sugar, and with the exception of a very scanty sprinkling now and then, no salt. When the corn is ground and fire is made, the bacon is taken down from the nail on which it hangs, a slice cut off and thrown upon the coals to broil. The majority of slaves have no knife, much less a fork. They cut their bacon with the axe at the wood pile. The cornmeal is mixed with a little water, placed in the fire, and baked. When it is done brown, the ashes are scraped off and being placed upon a chip which answers for a table. The tenant of the slave hut is ready to sit down upon the ground to supper. By this time it is usually midnight. The same fear of punishment with which they approach the gin house possesses them again on lying down to get a snatch of rest. It is this fear of oversleeping in the morning. Such an offense would certainly be attended with not less than twenty lashes, with a prayer that he may be on his feet and wide awake at the first sound of the horn, he sinks to his slumbers nightly. To the sound of the whip and the shrieks of black men and women, the slave owner and America grew wealthy. Yet it is all the more remarkable that even now the two hundred years of slavery are looked upon matter-of-factly, and not as a time of unrelieved horror. While there were many whites who recognized and fought against the inhumanity of slavery, the majority were much like the northerner who visited a southern plantation and described being awakened by the overseer's horn. I soon hear the tramp of the laborers passing along the avenue. All is soon again still as midnight. I believe I am the only one in the house that the bell disturbs, yet I do not begrudge the few minutes loss of sleep it causes me. It sounds so pleasantly in the half-dreamy morning. Perhaps the sound of other human beings being marched to the fields for another day of forced labor was a pleasant one, perhaps, but to those who made the sound, it was the dull, monotonous sound of the living deaths in which they were held captive. Chapter 4. Resistance to Slavery. Part 1. There are two ways in which a man can be enslaved. One is through force. He can be penned behind fences, guarded constantly, punished severely for breaking the slightest rule, and made to live in constant fear. The second is to teach him to think that his own best interest will be served by doing what his master wishes him to do. He can be taught that he is inferior, and that only through slavery will he eventually rise to the level of his master. The southern slave owner used both. The first was the way of the whip, the threat of the auction block, and murder. Its aim was to make the slave live in constant fear, the kind of fear that Solomon Northup described so vividly in the previous chapter. The second way was more subtle. Its aim was to brainwash the slave, to destroy his mind and replace it with the mind of the master. In that way the slave would enslave himself, and there would be no need to police him. A slave should have no sense of himself that was separate from the self the master wanted him to have. Thus it was that no black had a name of his own, he was given the surname of his owner, no matter how many owners he might have during his life. A negro has got no name. My father was a ransom, and he had an uncle named Hankin. If you belong to Mr. Jones and he sell you to Mr. Johnson, consequently you go by the name of your owner. Now where you get a name? We are wearing the name of our master. I was first a hail, then my father was sold, 
and then I was named Reed. Without a name of his own, the slave's ability to see himself apart from his owner was lessened. He was never asked who he was. He was asked, Whose nigger are you? The slave had no separate identity. He was always Mr. So-and-so's nigger. Another instrument used to control the minds of the slaves was religion. No slave owner allowed his slaves to attend church by themselves. Fearing that they would use the opportunity to plan an insurrection rather than thank God that they had such good masters. So the slave owner either did the preaching himself or hired a white preacher or let a trusted slave preach. The only preaching a slave owner approved of was that which would make the slave happy to be a slave. This is the way it go. Be nice to massa and missus. Don't be mean. Be obedient and work hard. That was all the Sunday school lesson they taught us. In Missouri, and as far as I have any knowledge of slavery in the other states, the religious teaching consists of teaching the slave that he must never strike a white man, that God made him for a slave, and that, when whipped, he must not find fault. For the Bible says, He that knoweth his master's will, and doeth it not, shall be beaten with many stripes. And slaveholders find such religion very profitable to them. Poor creatures! You little consider, when you are idle and neglectful of your master's business, when you steal and waste and hurt any of their substance, when you are saucy and impudent, when you are telling them lies and deceiving them, or when you prove stubborn and sullen and will not do the work you are set about without stripes and vexation, you do not consider, I say, that what faults you are guilty of towards your masters and mistresses are faults done against God himself. He who hath set your masters and mistresses over you in his own stead, he expects that you would do for them just as you would do for him. Your masters and mistresses are God's overseers, and that if you are faulty towards them, God himself will punish you severely for it in the next world, unless you repent of it and strive to make amends by your faithfulness and diligence for the time to come. Few slaves found arguments of this kind very convincing. However, from this religion which was preached to them, they took what they needed and could use. They fashioned their own kind of Christianity, which they turned to for strength in the constant times of need. In the Old Testament story of the enslavement of the Hebrews by the Egyptians, they found their own story. In the figure Jesus Christ, they found someone who had suffered as they had suffered, someone who understood, someone who offered them rest from their suffering. They so transformed the religion of the slave owner that eventually they came to look down upon the white preachers and white religious services. That old white preaching wasn't nothing. Old white preacher used to talk with their tongues without saying nothing, but Jesus told us slaves to talk with our hearts. There was an old man who would answer the preacher every Sunday meeting. He made so much noise, old master said, John, if you stop making noise in church, I'll get you a new pair of boots. John said, I'll try, master. The next meeting he tried and tried to be quiet so he could get his new boots, but the spirit got in him and he yelled out, Glory to God! Boots are no boots! Glory to God! Religion also presented the slaves with the idea that they would receive their reward after they died. This appealed to their minds, but they weren't necessarily convinced that the way to the promised heaven was through obedience to their owners. And sometimes they questioned the nature of that life after death and the heaven it promised. Uncle Silas was near about a hundred, I reckon, too feeble to do no work, but always got strength enough to hobble to church when the slave service gonna be. Old preacher was Reverend Johnson, forget the rest of his name. He was a preaching, and the slaves were sitting there sleeping and fanning theyselves with oak branches, and Uncle Silas got up in the front row of the slaves' pew and halted Reverend Johnson. Is us slaves gonna be free in heaven? Uncle Silas asked. The preacher stopped and looked at Uncle Silas like he want to kill him, cause no one ain't supposed to say nothing except amen while he was preaching. Waited a minute he did, looking hard at Uncle Silas standing there, but didn't give no answer. Is God gonna free us slaves when we get to heaven? Uncle Silas yelled. Old white preacher pulled his handkerchief and wiped the sweat from his face. Jesus says, come unto me, ye who are free from sin, and I will give you salvation. Going to give us freedom along with salvation, asked Uncle Silas. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away, and he that is without sin is going to have life everlasting. Then he went ahead preaching, fast like, without paying no attention to Uncle Silas. But Uncle Silas wouldn't sit down. 
stood there the rest of the service he did, and that was the last time he come to church. Uncle Silas died before another preaching time come around. Guess he found out whether he going to be free sooner than he calculated. The slave thought of heaven, but just as he made the white man's religion his own, he had his own heaven. The slaves, who are natives of this country, believe that those who have tormented them here will most surely be tormented in their turn hereafter. They are ready enough to receive the faith which conducts them to heaven and eternal rest on account of their present sufferings, but by no means so willingly admit the master and mistress to an equal participation in their enjoyments. According to their notions, the master and mistress are to be in future the companion of wicked slaves, whilst an agreeable recreation of the celestial inhabitants of the Negro's heaven will be a return to the overseer of the countless lashes that he has lent out so liberally here. It is impossible to reconcile the mind of the native slave to the idea of living in a state of perfect equality and boundless affection with the white people. Heaven will be no heaven to him if he is not to be avenged of his enemies. I know from experience that these are the fundamental rules of his religious creed, because I learned them in the religious meetings of the slaves themselves. The slave had many means of resisting the dehumanizing effects of slavery. Religion became one of them. It became a purifying force in the life of the slaves, a release from the everyday misery, and through the religious songs they made up from biblical stories, they expressed their real feelings about slavery. And in one of the greatest black religious songs, the slaves took the story of Samson, and with their genius for going to the core of an experience, they put these words into Samson's mouth and expressed their deepest feelings. If I had my way, if I had my way, if I had my way, I'd tear this building down. In the slave owner's attempts to control the minds of the slaves, one of the most constant ideas was the natural superiority of the white man and the natural inferiority of the black. The slave owner profaned the Portuguese word for black, negro, and made it nigger. It was a brutal, violent word that stung the soul of the slave more than the whip did his back. But the slaves took this ugly word and, like the white man's religion, made it their own. In their mouths it became an affectionate, endearing word. As much as was possible, they robbed it of its ability to spiritually maim them. Not only, however, did they have to combat being defined by a curse word. Because of their dark skin color, thin curly hair, thick lips, and broad noses, they were regarded as oddities, as creatures who could be ridiculed. Even the way they talked was regarded as a sign of their inferiority. The slaves were in the process of trying to fashion the English language to their tongues. The African languages are musical, and one word can have many meanings depending on the intonation it is given. Thus it was difficult for them to be satisfied with the rather flat intonations of English, and they made their own kind of English, one that was more musical, more pleasant to the ear. Perhaps the most eloquent discussion of black inferiority and white superiority was written by Thomas Jefferson, also the author of America's Rhetoric of Liberty. The first difference which strikes us is that of color. Whether the black or the negro resides in the reticular membrane between the skin and scarf skin, or in the scarf skin itself, whether it proceeds from the color of the blood, the color of the bile, or from that of some other secretion, the difference is fixed in nature and is as real as if its seat and cause were better known to us. And is this difference of no importance? Is it not the foundation of a greater or less share of beauty in the two races? Are not the fine mixtures of red and white the expressions of every passion by greater or less effusions of color in the one preferable to that eternal monotony which reigns in the countenances, that immovable veil of black which covers all the emotions of the other race? There are other physical distinctions proving a difference of race. They have less hair on the face and body. They secrete less by the kidneys and more by the glands of the skin, which gives them a very strong and disagreeable odor. They seem to require less sleep. A black after hard labor through the day will be induced by the slightest amusements to sit up until midnight or later, though knowing he must be out with the first dawn of the morning. They are at least as brave and more adventuresome. But this may perhaps proceed from a want of forethought, which prevents their seeing a danger till it is present. They are more ardent after their female, 
but love seems with them to be more an eager desire than a tender, delicate mixture of sentiment and sensation. Their griefs are transient. In general, their existence appears to participate more of the sensation than reflection. Comparing them by their faculties of memory, reason, and imagination, it appears to me that in memory they are equal to the whites, in reason much inferior, as I think one could scarcely be found capable of tracing and comprehending the investigations of Euclid, and that in imagination they are dull, tasteless, and anomalous. Never yet could I find that a black had uttered a thought above the level of plain narration, never saw even an elementary trait of painting or sculptor. In music they are more generally gifted than the whites, with accurate ears for tune and time, and they have been found capable of imagining a small catch. Whether they will be equal to the composition of a more extensive run of melody or of complicated harmony is yet to be proved. I advance it, therefore, as a suspicion only, that the blacks are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. Blacks who were born in this country had little with which to combat such ideas. They were born into slavery, lived in slavery, and died in slavery. What could they point to as proof that they were not inferior? Nothing, except a feeling within that it wasn't true. Those slaves who were native Africans were more fortunate in that they had former lives. Early in the 19th century there were still many native Africans on plantations. Charles Ball was one American-born black who grew up listening to stories of Africa from his grandfather and other Africans. They knew something else besides slavery. The native Africans are revengeful and unforgiving in their tempers, easily provoked and cruel in their designs. They generally place little or even no value upon the fine houses and superb furniture of their masters and discover no beauty in their fair complexions and delicate form of their mistresses. They feel indignant at the servitude that is imposed upon them and only want power to inflict the most cruel retribution upon their oppressors but they desire only the means of subsistence and temporary gratification in this country. They are universally of the opinion, and this opinion is founded in their religion, that after death they shall return to their own country and rejoin their former companions and friends in some happy region in which they will be provided with plenty of food and beautiful women from the lovely daughters of their native land. The slave who was born in America, however, had borrowed all his ideas of present and future happiness from the opinions and intercourse of white people and of Christians, as Charles Ball pointed out, and some accepted these ideas totally. I thought as long as I stayed where the white folks was, they would protect me from all harm, even the stars and the elements, storms or what not. Just stay near the white folk and I had nothing to worry about. I thought white folks made the stars, the sun, and everything on the earth. I know nothing but to be driven and beat all the time. I seen him take the bottom rail out of the rail fences and stick the nigger's head in the hole, then jam the balance of the fence down on his neck and beat him till he's stiff. The slaves who exemplified those qualities of obedience, submissiveness, and dependence have come to be known as Uncle Toms, the name being taken from the central character of Harriet Beecher Stowe's anti-slavery novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Generally, these Uncle Toms were those slaves who had the most contact with the master and his family, the house servants. Because of this constant contact, the house servants were much more likely to be the model slaves that slaveholders dreamed of. Quite often, a house servant was trained to his duty from childhood. He was separated from the other slaves, and from that time on, he slept on a pallet on the floor of the owner's bedroom or outside his door. He was raised to believe that to be a house servant was the greatest honor that could come to him. My master gave me better clothes than the little slaves of my age generally received. He often told me that he intended to make me his waiter, and that if I behaved, well, I should become his overseer in time. These stations of waiter and overseer appeared to me the highest points of honor and greatness in the whole world, and had no circumstances frustrated my master's plans as well as my own views, I should probably have been living at this time in a cabin on the corner of some tobacco plantation. On many plantations, house servants were hated by the slaves who worked in the fields. These servants often took their master's interests so seriously that they acted as spies for them. House servants were responsible for uncovering and revealing to slave owners innumerable planned slave insurrections. They taught us to be against one another, 
and no matter where you would go, you would always find one that would tattle and have the white folks pecking on you. They would be trying to make it soft for themselves. Many of them are the most despicable tale bearers and mischief makers who will, for the sake of the favor of his master and mistress, frequently betray his fellow slaves and by tattling get him severely whipped. And for these acts, he is often rewarded by his master, who knows it is for his interest to keep such ones about him, though he is sometimes obliged, in addition to a reward, to send him away for fear of the vengeance of the betrayed slaves. Sleeping in a room adjacent to the slaves who were ironed, I discerned enough from their conversation to enable me to know that a mutiny was abroad, and that it was that intention of the slaves, in order to effect their freedom, to put to death all the whites on board, and that I too was included, owing to the attention that was paid me, with the doomed. By jests and cheerfulness with them, however, I gathered their detached hints from their every movement that they had even provided themselves with a file from the lot of the blacksmith tools on board, and that many were at that moment free from their chains. This information I carried to my master, and after ascertaining the truth of my statement, he had them again bound more firmly than ever. Charles Ball tried on two occasions to win his master's favor, though he was a field hand. In the first instance he was instrumental in the capture of two slaves who had murdered the daughter of a neighboring slave owner. He received nothing for his effort, though. He tried to win his owner's favor again by building a fish trap on his own time and catching a number of fish. I gave a large fish to the overseer and took three more to the great house. These were the first fresh fish that had been in the family this season, and I was much praised by my master and young mistresses for my skill and success in fishing. But this was all the advantage I received from this effort to court the favor of the great. The part I had performed in the detection of the murders of the young lady was forgotten, or at least not mentioned now. I went away from the house not only disappointed, but chagrined, and thought to myself that if my master and young mistresses had nothing but words to give me for my fish, we should not carry on a very large traffic. He was only interested in the welfare of his owner to the degree that his own needs and interests were served. This was the typical attitude of the field hand. Many house slaves, however, shared the attitudes of the field hand. They used their positions inside the great house to spy on the master, not for him. What serving gal for missus used to have to stand behind her at the table and reach her the salt and syrup and anything else she called for. Old master would spell out real fast anything he don't want me to know about. One day Massa was fit to be tied. He was in such a bad mood, was raving about the crops and the taxes and the trifling niggers he got to feed. Going to sell him, I swear for Christ, I'm going to sell him, he says. Then old missus asked which ones he going to sell and tell him quick to spell it. Then he spell out G-A-B-E and Rufus, R-U-F-U-S. Of course, I stood there without batting any eye and making believe I didn't even hear him. But I was packing them letters up in my head all the time. And soon as I finished dishes, I rushed down to my father and Sam to him, just like Massa Sam. Father says quiet like, Gabe and Rufus, and told me to go on back to the house and say I ain't been out. The next day, Gabe and Rufus was gone. They had run away. Massa nearly died, got to cussing and raving, so he took sick. Mrs. went to town and told the sheriff, but they never could find those two slaves. I'll be so glad when oh, the, well, well, the sun goes down. When the sun goes down. I'll be so glad when oh, the, well, the sun goes down. When the sun goes down. I ain't all that sleepy, but oh, well, I want to lie down. I want to lie down. I ain't all that sleepy, but oh, well, I want to lie down. I want to lie down. I want to lie down. Little bird got a name. You call it sparrow. Drop of water got a name. 
you call it rain But I am a man, yes I am oh. But it's slave you call me You have seen my face Don't you know my name When your fields come up white <laughs> You call that cotton When the furrows grow green You call that sugar cane I work your fields, yes I do, till I'm old and weary, still it's boy you call me, don't you know my name? 